Welcome to the Story A Day podcast. This is Julie Duffy, encouraging you to be a writer today, not someday. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to the Story A Day podcast. I have a special guest for us today. My guest today Hello. is Seamus McDonald. <laughs> Hello. Nice to see everyone. <laughs> Also known as Seamus Donaloch, which is his name in Gaelic, because he is from Scotland and does speak Gaelic. In fact, Seamus has a master's, dual master's in Gaelic studies and linguistics, uh, language and linguistics. And the reason I have invited him on the show today is because he's a bit of an expert in conlangs. And I'm going to get him to explain what that is in a minute. But basically, um, if you ever work in a fantasy world or any world where you want to make up a language, this is what you're talking about. Um, And I'll get him to explain more about that in a minute. Seamus has spoken at the uh, uh, ULAB Con conference, uh, which is the Undergraduate Language Language Association of Britain. He's spoken at their conference in Edinburgh and London. He has spoken at the Celtic Studies Conference in Edinburgh about languages, and he has spoken in Cambridge this year at the Conference for the Language Creation Society. And he was also instrumental in bringing David J. Peterson, who invented languages for things like Game of Thrones and uh, the 100, to Scotland to give a talk at Edinburgh University. Welcome, Seamus. Thank you very much. So, first of all, let's have you do a little uh, proper definition of what a conlang is for those of us who are not immersed in this world. So, yeah, conlangs. Um, The term conlang seems to be getting more and more popular these days. Um, uh, So it stands for constructed language. Um, And constructed languages are just languages but they differ from what i mean you can say they differ from real languages but since conlangs are usually real languages they they differ from natural languages um uh, in that natural languages happen sort of accidentally um no one decided one day oh yes uh i speak proto-germanic today but tomorrow i'm going to speak old saxon (laughs) Um, it it just sort of you know people moved around and changed and spoke with other people and uh, transmission through generation changed the language as as people forgot things and made up better things and made up worse things um but a conlang someone sat down and went right i'm going to make up a language and it's going to have a bunch of rules and a bunch of words that aren't uh collected together in any one other single language in the world. Um, So they usually have a single creator or a few small groups, a a few small people in a group uh, creating a language. People will probably have heard of invented languages and and they'll think of, you know, Klingon. That's one Mm -hmm. that sort of amused people when I was growing up, that people were actually, (laughs) you know, learning Klingon. And now I think it's quite normal. Um, (laughs) I, so what other, it's more than just Klingon, right? There's there's a lot of this happening now. So much more, so much more. I mean, I would, I would go out on a limb and say that there might actually be more conlangs in the world where you can have at least a rudimentary conversation than there are natural languages currently being huh. used in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean that anyone uses these conlangs or that you can write great literature in them or anything, just that there's lots of them. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's, there's so many. So Klingon is a good example. There's Dothraki, which people t- tend to be uh, quite aware of these days. Um, That's from uh, Game Nat of Thrones, v. right? Yeah, Dothraki from Game of Thrones. And then Natvi was quite popular uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, is when that the, the Avatar one? Yeah, they're one way a conlang can come about. So a producer decided that um, they want their film to be sort of an immersive experience and that if they're going to have these alien cultures or these you know different cultures from uh, real cultures, um, then they should have, then the backdrop of that should include the fact that language should be 
usable in some way it's not just gibberish um that's where I want to ask you because your background is interesting I think because you live in Scotland mm -hmm. in a country that's native language was suppressed mm -hmm. um I didn't know until relatively recently that Gaelic was even ever spoken in the part of Scotland that I grew <laughs> up in can you talk a little bit about the importance of language and culture in the real world and specifically Gaelic and um and how that shapes society, just so that people who may have grown up in a monolingual environment and, and always in the same place might get a little bit more about when we're writing stories, why this stuff matters. My language background is a complex sociolinguistic set of factors. Um, so I, I'm not a fluent native speaker of Gaelic myself, and I, I decided to go to university to learn it um, after um, being sent to an English-speaking school and not getting the chance to learn Gaelic. Uh, Although your father is that. from a family of native speakers and is a native speaker, yes, right? Yes, yeah. So I went to university to learn Gaelic as a language, but um, obviously you can't learn a language without learning about the culture of the language. And so... Well, you say the, obviously. Why obviously? When I say obviously, you can't learn a language without learning the culture. For a language like Gaelic, uh, there are tens of thousands of speakers. That's a lot of people, but compared to the number of speakers of English or Spanish or even Russian. Um, so those, those languages, they're very big and they're spoken over multiple cultural areas. And so people use the languages, use those languages in different ways in different regions. They're still unified by uh, the fact that there's free exchange of information between most of those places. So uh, there might be some divergence here and there at the moment, which will continue, but it's not a huge divergence. So you end up with a sort of cultural levelling where um, some, I guess, my English is quite international. My My accent is very... Scottish uh, most of the time. Um, hey, but I can use bits and pieces of English from different places because I've been exposed to them. And so basically when I speak English, I can use the grammar rules any way I like, uh, as long as it obeys the grammar rules and I can convey information. And people might look at me weirdly if I say something a bit funny, but they'll accept that because lots of people speak English from all over the world and not everyone is a native speaker and people say things in different ways. Whereas for Gaelic, the number of speakers is smaller um, and it's a living language. So people use it uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, but it's really, it's, it's a smaller, more cohesive cultural um, unit that it's being spoken in. So um, there are, within the culture, there are set ways of saying things. And there's a, like, you you can't just learn the grammar rules and learn the vocabulary and say, I'm speaking Gaelic. Because then if you go up to a Gaelic speaker and start speaking to them, a, a native Gaelic speaker, they might not actually understand you. Like, you might be conveying information using the grammar rules and using words but you won't be saying anything to them because the way they use the language is in a particular way and obviously you know there's variation in different regions of Gaelic uh, and they'll refuse to speak to you know someone from Lewis might refuse to speak to someone from Uist for example <laughs> because they use the wrong pronunciation of the word for milk um <laughs> as one real example. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, uh, so, uh, uh, so may maybe they might not refuse to speak to them, but a real, real example, in a paper I read, um, someone was doing a sociolinguistic uh, survey on attitudes to different regional variations in Gaelic in the media. And they went to the island of Lewis and they spoke to people there and people complained that the Gaelic being used on TV 
was always too much like the Gaelic of Uist, further south. And then they went to Uist, spoke to some people from there, who then complained that the Gaelic being used on TV was too much like the Gaelic of Lewis, and they didn't <laughs> like it. <laughs> um, what's really happening was, you know, there's a mixture of... Uh, there's a mixture of people speaking on TV and people will pick up on, on uh, the, the ones they don't like. <laughs> um, but For the, reference, how far apart are those two uh, islands? Not very far. Uh, <laughs> it's like a few hundred miles, right? It, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many miles, but, you know, it's less than a day's journey by, like, you know... Um, it, you have to take the ferry between them, which adds a few hours, but mm -hmm. if, if there was a road between them, you know... Two, three hours, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I, you know, the fact that you do have to take a ferry does keep the culture, does keep the, the cultures and the communities, give them that uh, isolation. So this is all really interesting, thinking about this from the context of a writer. Mm -hmm. Just even what you said there about the difference between these more international languages that are, are spread out and how people mm -hmm. communicate and then these more small, isolated languages and how picky people might be mm -hmm. from a smaller community. So that's, I think, a really interesting thought for a writer. You know, what if when you're inventing a language for your story or your world, what kind of, is it going to be one of these languages that people use all over the continent or all over the, the planet? Or is it going to be something that's just regional and then is that going to cause, pro you know, what kind of other problems is that going to cause for your main character if they speak this minority language or something? So, Yeah, actually, social linguistics, I think, is a great underexplored area for conflict and problems and obstacles in, in fiction writing. I, like, I, I have read quite a few books recently that have been treating this really quite well. So I've read more recently that have done it well than I have read recently ones that haven't explored it at all um but yeah like if you have um if you're writing a set on one planet maybe one continent and your characters are traveling around not everyone is going to speak the same thing people are going to speak things differently um and it would be you know it would probably be fun to explore that you don't have to make up a language. If you're coming up with a language that is going to grow out of the story you've started to tell already, what do you think the, is the minimum? I mean, well, the minimum viable language work you've said is none. They don't have to do this. They can, you know, like you can talk about language issues without actually inventing a language. But if someone is interested in inventing a new language for their world, what would be the sort of minimum work you think needs to get done and what things should they be thinking about as they come up with that? It's interesting you said that. I said no work or none. Uh, that was actually, that is actually the minimum. Like if you're starting with a story and you want a language to come out of that, you have to start thinking there. That is the minimum you have to do. Um, whether or not you start making up words and sentences for it, you don't, that, that, is, that is extra work on top of that. Um, uh, a good example... I recently read the Ancillary Justice series by Anne Leckie. Um, she's not got a full conlang presented in that. There's no vocabulary list at the back of the book where she um, says, here's the language I made up. Um, but in this book, the setting is across a vast empire that covers many worlds in the galaxy. and she spends a lot of time in the book. She doesn't take time out of the story to do it, but it, it crops up naturally. People, people in different places uh, speak differently, have different languages. Um, uh, and most interestingly enough, most interesting out of all of it, um, the sort of standard language that the protagonists use and the leader of the empire uses has a sort of signed component to it it's a spoken language but um the author talks about ways in which they make gestures that is 
more than simply what I'm doing with my hands just now, which is wiggling them about, about for emphasis. She uh, has the occasional made up word in there, but um, she thought about, so this planet is very far away from the center of this empire. Uh, lots of these people don't speak the standard language that the empire imposes upon them very well. or uh, And so the characters have to adjust to that and characters struggle with pronunciation. They, uh, the characters are judged on how well they speak the language, you know. So I said you don't have to have a background in linguistics. linguistics. You don't. But Wikipedia, linguistics, that's very helpful. Start with grammar, things that you know about, and look them up and sort of see where it goes from there. Um, there, is, there is a danger. You can do whatever you want. If you get overexcited and start putting clicks everywhere, people will make fun of you for it. <laughs> which brings me to the question I wanted to ask, which is what are some of the common pitfalls mm. when people are, when you're starting to think about creating a new language? Like how do you mark yourself as an amateur? Like, <laughs> lots of apostrophes and lots of clicks, is that? <laughs> oh yes, definitely. I, I, was, I, I have apostrophes written down, just apostrophes, the word apostrophe. Um, but that, that's that's a... That one and that one is a personal one of mine. Like people put in apostrophes into alien names, uh, Elvish place names in their non-Tolkienian Elvish language things, uh, without defining clearly what the uh, apostrophe is going to do first. So, have some uh, kind of system is is uh, seems like yeah. an underlying lesson there. Okay, yeah. So we could say for making up words um don't just go with a uh, the pronunciation pronunciation of english words um if you want it to look if you want it to look okay and reasonable instead of like you got excited when you found a whole toolbox full of new phonemes um <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm sounding a lot nastier than I mean to here. <laughs> no, no, I think you're being, I think you, this is coming from a place of love, right? You, <laughs> but I do think Toolkit of New Phonemes is an excellent band name. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, we digress. You, you're making up words. <laughs> well, you're making up words. Um, you, you don't necessarily, you probably don't actually want to just go with uh, putting together sounds, you know, from English and spelling them the way you would or you try to avoid spelling things the way you would spell them in English unless you have worked out a consistent way to do that because English orthography is a terrible starting point for any language <laughs> because it, well it's a very interesting orthography because it's a historical orthography um a old English people started writing that down and there was a there's a reasonable correspondence between the letters you were writing and the sounds you were making. Uh, so when you had um, when you had the word uh, that was spelt H W A T, that was pronounced Hwet. Uh, so all the sounds were there. Um, most regions of English these days don't need the H in there for the word W-H-A-T. You probably don't want uh, to put in any fancy letters at first. Um, if you just sort of take a bunch of sounds that you want, you can make them sounds different from English or not. And then just decide on like a letter for each sound at first. Um, so I talked about words in terms of sound. Um, that's just You've picked up your phonology and your ortho orthography. Different languages have different writing systems. You don't need to make that up right away, that you can make that up later. Uh, you don't even have to make up your orthography right away. Just decide on some sounds, start making some words. And then when it comes to actually words, so semantics. This, this doesn't go for just people writing stories about made-up languages, but the whole... Um, 200 words for snow thing you know there's a language out there that apparently has 200 words for snow uh, that was 
made up by someone as a sort of like, surely these people who are surrounded by snow all the time have 200 words for snow. And then people took it as fact and repeat it. Uh, they might have 200 words for snow. They might have just one. If they're surrounded by snow, they probably have one word for snow. But then they, you know, like they could use adjectives. They don't have to have 200 words for snow. So you don't, in, in, when you're making up languages, you don't have to, not everything is going to be how you expect it to be. So, for example, colors. All cultures in the world, as far as I know, live most of their time above ground, get to see the sky. Uh, and in most places of the world, they get to see the clear sky a lot of the time. Not here, not today. <laughs> um, but, uh, but also a lot of cultures don't have a word for the color of the sky. They, it, it might be that they don't have the word for blue and therefore they have a word that, color, that covers more colors than we would assign to blue and it includes the color of the sky. But they might also just not think of, like, they might not talk about the sky in terms of this is a thing that needs a color. Um, so the 200 words for snow thing, that's supposed to be about how your environment shapes your language. But it doesn't always happen that way. Um, it, the environment does contribute to your language. So um, coming back to Gaelic, Gaelic has a lot of um, words for seafaring that are borrowed from Old Norse because the Vikings came along and invaded Scotland, or what is now Scotland, and they took over for a while. They, they then assimilated into the native culture and became Gaelic-speaking, but they left a lot of words that they had for things that they were really good at because they were a um, the people who settled in Scotland were very good at seafaring, so they did ha happen to have a lot of practical uses for different words for different things. Um, uh, and so Gaelic has a lot of Viking words for being on the sea or being on the water. Um, so some things happen the way you expect them to, but not always. You, you, can, you can make it how you want it to be. So it can follow people's expectations and it can't color terms in language is really interesting um uh, the if you if you read up on how people have dug into um how color terms evolve just just color terms uh lots of cultures start out with um two color terms sort of broadly divided into sort of light and dark and then later on they most tend to introduce a third which is usually called red hmm. uh, it it primarily covers red things like you know um the color of blood the color of soil you know um <clears throat> if you've got reddish soil you know whatever um and then they start making up more complex things later maybe not every culture has done this. Um, so there are still languages that only have three or four color color terms. Uh, in Gaelic, the word for the color of grass is also the color of the sky and the sea, whereas the color green is a separate word. Huh. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So people really could get into a rabbit hole here and never emerge to write a story like we again. have in our tangents yes <laughs> <laughs> so i think it's really helpful that you gave us some basic like start with this start with you know thinking about how the language is used in the culture start with some sounds make up a word or two be consistent and then then start thinking about how to put things together and how you might write them and, you know, get, get more complicated as need be. Um, yeah. But you don't need to invent a full grammatical language to get going. Yeah, you can, you can start with something small. Um, there are, there are, there's advice wherein 
you don't start with the sounds, you start with the grammar and then you decide what sounds would be appropriate for how you feel the language is going to develop. Um, I I do it a bad way. I, I start with the sounds and then decide where the grammar is going to go because I'm better at phonology than I am at grammar. I, I'm good with sounds. Um, uh, but yeah, you don't. You also don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, you can... Uh, you don't... You might be tempted to go, ah, yes, my, my grammar needs to be completely unique. It doesn't need to be completely unique. Just cherry pick things um, that you understand. Well, thank you very much, Seamus, for coming on and talking to us about this fascinating subject. And You're if very welcome. people have questions, I will um, maybe try and get some of them to you. And I threw you into doing a big, broad overview of a very complex topic. So I think you've <laughs> given us things to think about and uh, we appreciate it. So um, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. Why not come over to the blog at storyaday.org and check out this week's writing prompts and articles. And in the meantime, have a great creative week. And of course, keep writing.